Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. We're filming today from one of the most remote locations we've ever filmed in Old West vignette, and that's the site of the Omen Massacre, many miles north of the I-8 in the middle of what is still nowhere Arizona. It's quite difficult to get to this location even today. However, on February 18th, 1851, almost an entire family was massacred out here by Western Yavapai Indians. Royce, Marianne, his wife, who was eight months pregnant, and three other children were beaten to death with clubs. Three of their other children survived, and that's part of the reason we're here to tell the story, because it's an epic one. But the first question we have to answer is, why was a family alone out here on February 18th, 1851, which was then even more the middle of nowhere? And the answer for that is religion. They were Mormons, but they were a specific sect of Mormonism called Brewsterites. After the assassination of Joseph Smith, the Mormon church started fractionalizing, trying to determine their path forward. And a young child at the age of 10 named Brewster started having visions from God. And in his visions, he learned that California was the land of peace, Sidonia, the place where it was going to be the promised land for the Mormons. And as a result, the upper echelons of the Mormon church started having issues with the Brewsters or Brewsterites who believed his visions because he started contradicting visions that came originally from Joseph Smith. The church fractionalized and the fraction that became followers of this 10 year old child were named Brewsterites. They believed that California was going to be the land of peace, Sidonia, and a group of them, about 50 from Independence, Missouri, started heading west, made it to Tucson in January, crossed through Picacho Pass, which was the path of that path of that time, over to what were called the Pima Villages. And at that point, they heard that going this way was particularly dangerous. And a bunch of them stopped and decided to wait at that location. But Royce was determined that he was going to make it safely and took his family alone west to make it to Sidonia. For February 14th, they left Pima Villages. Four days later, after very hard travel through extremely unadvantageous terrain, they made it to this location. Royce and his family was here trying to fix their wagon and deal with going up what was to describe a very difficult rocking encampment as something we can't even describe to you. We're gonna put that in the video. However, they were here at this site. Lorenzo, his son, looks off in the distance and sees approximately 17 Indians coming their way and tells his dad, hey dad, someone's coming this way. And sure enough, these Indians came up and started discussing in Spanish with Royce, trying to trade with him. Actually, what they did ask for was tobacco. He provided them some of the tobacco and they walked off to the side and smoked the tobacco and came back. And they said, now we need food, give us food. Royce at that point determined he didn't have enough food for his family to make it all the way to the land of peace, Sidonia, and told them no, he would not. Those Native Americans stepped off to the side and started speaking in their native tongue. Meanwhile, the Oatman families here just milling about doing their stuff while this is going off, in, off to the side of them. Suddenly, these indigenous people raised their war clubs and started beating the family to death, immediately killing Royce, Marianne, and three of the children, as well as striking Lorenzo across the head, assuming he was dead. They then looted the wagon, destroyed it, captured Olive and Marianne, and took them as slaves and headed west. Lorenzo either stumbled after beaten in the head with the war club, or the indigenous people picked him up and threw him, but it was on this path that he took, not knowing where he was going, probably blood in his eyes and completely delirious to this edge, where he got too close and fell. Rolling all the way to the bottom, waking up hours later, stumbling his way back up this mountain, all the way up, nearly beaten to death, to find his entire family massacred, his sister Olive and his sister Marianne missing. Lorenzo finds most of his family dead, and of course, Olive and Marianne missing at the top of the butte. Nearly beaten to death and rolled down the side of the butte, he wanders east looking for help, hopefully to reunite with the immigrants. He does stumble across a friendly band of the Pima Indian tribe, and they take him in and try and help him recuperate. But he wakes up at some point, either the middle of the night or the morning, we don't know, sees himself amongst a bunch of indigenous people and panics, not remembering that these are friendly Pima Indians, and flees under a panic attack, probably some form of PTSD ultimately makes it far enough east that he reunites with an immigrant trail, probably more of the Brewsterites, and brings them back to the massacre site. The bodies are there just rotting in the sun. They attempt to bury these bodies, but the ground is so hard that it's not possible. They end up just laying them on the surface and piling rocks over them, much like this monument you see to my right. Some people refer to this as the grave. Some people refer to this as a monument. However, if this is the grave or a monument, it would have looked exactly like this. Whether the Oatmans are under this spot or not, we are not sure. We have read stuff that Charles Poston, the founder of Arizona, moved their bodies to another location. They may have been reinterred, but ultimately Lorenzo and Brewsterites buried their bodies somewhere in this location, in either this grave or this monument, representing their gravesite thereof. Lorenzo at that point continues back 
and determines that he is going to spend the rest of his life dedicated to finding his sisters, Olive and Marianne. However, Olive and Marianne have been taken captive by the Western Yavapai tribe. They refer to them as Apaches. We'll get more to that later. For one year, Olive and Marianne are treated like slaves, beaten, forced into manual labor, and treated pretty much deplorably. However, the local Mojave people trade with the Avahai regularly. The chief of the Mojave were coming out to trade with the Avapai, and his daughter saw the plight of Olive and Marianne and negotiated with her father that they should trade with them for those two white girls. The Mojave leader traded diligently with the Avapai. It was a difficult trade, but they were able to negotiate it. And Olive and Marianne, after one year of servitude to the Avapai people, go to live with the Mojave. The Mojave turn out to be quite friendly and treat them like family, treat them like friends, feed them, take good care of them, and do not treat them as slaves. There was a famine in 1855-56 in which the Mojave struggled very much, and unfortunately Marianne died in that famine. According to Olive, however, it was not because the tribe allowed her to starve to death. They tried to save everyone, including her and her sister Marianne. However, Marianne just succumbed to the famine. During her time with the tribe, Olive was given not only an official name in the tribe, but a nickname, which is very common amongst the Mojave people for people they consider to be part of their tribe and their society. And she was also provided a very striking blue tattoo, which in the book that we'll discuss later was talked about as being a tattoo of the slaved. But actually we now know that that blue tattoo on Olive's chin was that of finding their friends and their family in the afterlife. That blue tattoo indicated that you were part of the Mojave people. And in fact, there are pictures of Mojave people and other Mojave women with the same exact tattoo that were later described as the tattoo of a slave. However, what this really meant was that when Olive passed away, that her and her Mojave friends and family would find each other in the afterlife. After four years of living with the Mojave people in friendly conditions as part of the tribe, the local fort determined that there was, two, there was a white girl captured by the Mojave people, and they sent a missive to the Mojave people that they should let her go. The second missive that came to the Mojave people stated, let her go or we will come destroy you. At this point, the Mojave people are reluctant and don't want to give up their family and their friend that they have found in Olive Oatman. However, it is determined that for the safety of the tribe, they need to. They hike her all the way back 20 some miles over to this fort. She comes in in traditional Mojave dress, just a skirt, bare breasted. One of the women that was part of, this, of the fort gives her normal Western clothing to cover up, of course, her nakedness. And she is then returned to the white society. Her brother Lorenzo finds out that she's at the fort and her, their reconnection turns out to be a huge media event across all the newspapers that Lorenzo and Olive, who was this slave of not only the Yavapai, Apache at the time, and the Mojave has been returned to civilized society. In 1857, a Reverend Stratton came to Lorenzo and Olive and wanted to write a book about her harrowing story. And in the process of that, a lot of narratives came out of that that were based on xenophobia and other issues of the day. Her tattoo, which actually indicated her membership in the tribe and finding her family and friends in the afterlife, became the tattoo of a slave. And her, her, her time with the Mojave turned into one of friendship and family as one of servitude and slavery, in which she tried to escape but could not. We know this is really not accurate because we know that the actual tattoo indicates that she was part of the tribe. We also know that at one time there were white settlers trading with the Mojave and she saw them and did nothing to contact them during her duration of time and stay there. She was only returned to white society upon the fort's statement that if they were, she was not returned, she would be destroyed, or the tribe would be destroyed, excuse me. That said, Reverend Stratton made a lot of really hyperbolic statements in his book and it was a bestseller and he made a lot of money on it. Olive later in life met a white man who was a cattleman and she moved to Texas as his wife and lived in Texas essentially a basic normal life. She never had children, but however did adopt a child during the duration of her marriage. She did not invite Reverend Stratton to her marriage ceremonies, which is indicative of what she thought of the man at the time. One of the things we do want to bring up, which is interesting and he left out of the book, however, is that as I said earlier in the video, members of the Mojave tribe were given an official name and a nickname. And if you were given a nickname, you were truly loved. And those nicknames were typically somewhat comical. However, her nickname was Rotten Womb. And they left it out because, of course, that was far too salacious for the Victorian era of the time. However, Olive Oatman did live with the Mojave for four years. She was there until the age of 19. We also know that she adopted a child with her official husband in Texas and never actually gave birth to her own child. This, of course, is left to conjecture. She herself stated in the book that she never had any relations with the Mojave people. However, I would say that with the nickname, the fact that she denied her tattoo and stated that she was a slave of the Mojave in the book because of the xenophobia of the time, it's kind of an easy assertion to make that perhaps she was infertile and was not able to bear children with the Mojave people, nor with her later white husband. However, that's conjecture. After Olive was returned to white society, a very prominent Mojave chief was traveling in the United States 
in an effort to experience where the white man originated from. And during one of his times in New York, Olive actually went there to go see him. And during her visit with him, he said to her, we wish you would come back to your family and friends. And I have a hard time believing that if Olive really felt that her time with the Mojave was one of slavery and servitude, that she would have went to meet a Mojave chief. Not only that, to speak with him on friendly terms and be invited back to the tribe. This once again reinforces that Reverend Stratton's book was one of hyperbolic xenophobia, which was what would sell copy at the time. Olive Oatman died at the age of 65 in the year 1903, married to a white cattleman living out in Texas, reportedly suffering from bouts of depression throughout her entire life. She was also reported to have been put into an asylum, but that is not correct. Her husband did land up in an asylum at some point, but she did not. However, based on her depression, her visiting the Mojave chief when he was in New York, as well as the fact that she was reluctant to leave the tribe, I think conjecture can lead us to the conclusion that perhaps she had many loved ones amongst the Mojave people, perhaps even a mate. Imagine being forced to leave your loved one based on social norms and not by your own choice. And her depression certainly would be one reason that that might be an explanation for what happened to Olive Oatman. However, we know that her tattoo was indicative of what the Mojave people did find to find their people and their family and tribe in the afterlife. And I'd like to think that when Olive passed away, she got to make the choice she never got to make in life. Which people did she decide to live with? Guys, if you like this kind of content, please consider supporting us on Patreon. It's you, the viewer, that keep InRange alive. We're not advertiser-supported or sponsor-supported by anyone besides you, the viewer. If you can't, we understand. Just subscribe to one of our channels. You can find them all at InRange.tv. Share with your friends, and thank you for watching.